In the last two weeks, we've seen yet another murder of an innocent black man at the hands of an overpowered, over-militarized police force. George Floyd was murdered by former Minneapolis officer Derek Chauvin. Chauvin put his knee on Floyd's neck for over eight minutes, which was all captured on camera. How is it that cops haven't figured out that we the people are watching them constantly and there's like cameras everywhere? For being the namesake of the police state, they are not too bright about how one operates. Chauvin and his compatriots were fired, but not charged with anything for like a full week. The mayor of Minneapolis and the Hennepin County DA uh, said that they had to review all of the evidence. Apparently their eyes don't function well between Monday and Thursday. It takes him a little while to, to adjust to, to everything. Eventually he was charged with third degree murder, which after an autopsy has been bumped up to second degree murder. Even then, the city claimed that death was uh, a result of a heart condition. Oh yes, uh, the heart condition that includes symptoms like a 200 pound officer on your neck. Does this make racist police a pre-existing condition? Now Chauvin committed first degree murder and it was caught on film. The other three officers were accomplices and they all belong in prison for a very long time. Now the nation erupted into protest. Some of these turned violent and that became the narrative. The narrative wasn't what to do about a violent policing and racism within the American criminal justice system, but rather that a, a soccer mom can't buy a new top at a reasonable price from Target because riots. Now, most of the protests have been peaceful and then instigated by police presence. There is hundreds and hundreds of accounts of cops barreling through crowds of protesters, attacking journalists with batons and shields, and firing tear gas into crowds of chanting protesters. The violent response from cops is getting so out of hand that when the FBI asked for violent agitators at protests, or rather evidence of violence agitators at protests, people sent them videos of police officers accosting protesters. I think the FBI was expecting photos of, I don't know, like people pretending to be Tyler Durden. There are also stories of undercover police officers or hired provocateurs instigating the violence while the organizers of the protest try to stay on, to stay on top of this and stop these folks from committing property destruction. There's videos of a man dressed in all black carrying an umbrella breaking the windows of an auto zone in Minneapolis. Wearing all black and an umbrella? I mean, clearly we are looking for a super albino here. But if we put out an APB on that guy, somehow the cops will still try to arrest an innocent black man claiming that they match the description of a super albino. But that's what you get when you forego IQ for muscles, compliance, and institutionalized racism. Now in Boston, the, the police were caught vandalizing their own cars and then driving off. They were clearly enforcing the stop hitting yourself version of policing. Now this is to employ the broken window effect where if a group of people see a neighborhood with a broken window, they are uh, more likely to escal escalate acts of criminality and property destruction. The cops are manufacturing this effect. So to my fellow protester friends, be wise and let's do our best not to get agitated by state-sponsored property destruction. Now there is also non-cop agitators in the form of anarchists and even white nationalists that specifically go in to disrupt these protests. The cops are nowhere in sight when these folks start their dirty shenanigans, but this fact has hit the ears of 
every member of the Republican Party. And that's why Ted Cruz put a piece of legislation to ensure that these bad apples don't get b picked from the tree. I lost the saying there. I'm not really sure what the saying is, but I, I think you understand, right? Because Ted Cruz and his GOP freedom enthusiasts crafted a bill to make Antifa illegal. The problem with this bill is that they used the term Antifa and left-wing protesters interchangeably throughout the bill. Right? They denounced the actions of Antifa and left-wing protesters and used journalist Andy No as an example of how violent Antifa is. Andy No was attacked by Antifa uh, a, a associated protesters last year and then was hospitalized. So the claim they make is that Antifa is attacking journalists who are trying to do their jobs. Odd that the bill fails to mention that journalists are getting pummeled on camera by cops with rubber bullets, batons, tear gas, and good old-fashioned fisticuffs. Wait a minute. Is the GOP alluding that the cops are Antifa now? I mean, according to this logic, that this means that Antifa and the fa, shorthand for fascists, are one and the same. They also mention that the that ICE was uh, threatened with violence and that their personal information was released. Boy, they're going to have a real tough time with how much the cops and ICE threatened violence. The cops during these protests alone have said on camera that they're going to beat the fuck out of people. Is there a legislation written by Ted Cruz and the GOP thugs to prevent any of that? The answer is no. This is like the Ouroboros, you know, the image of a snake eating itself. This is like the Ouroboros of bootlicking. Legislation like this protects law enforcement's efforts to brutalize protesters and citizens while they protect these lawmakers who write authoritarian, racist, and unconstitutional laws that the police then get to enforce. And as if that wasn't enough, earlier in the week, President Donald Trump, after making people wait approximately 32 minutes staring at an empty podium, said he was ready to invoke the Insurrection Act of 1807. This lets the president call in armed forces and the National Guard when there's an uprising or insurrection, domestic violence, unlawful combination, and conspiracy in any state that depraves constitutional rights. Now, this act was modified twice, in 1861 to add the National Guard, and then in 1871 to protect black folks after the KKK wanted to attack them. It ensured the addition of the Equal Protections Clause. So, in reality, this act should have been invoked to ensure that the military would protect its own citizens from the police that constantly keep killing all of us, particularly those of the melanated variety. Talk, we're talking about black and brown people, just in case you were confused about the term melanated. That's right. Sometimes I like to get flowery. You guys know that. Now, the Insurrection Act has been invoked a few times in history. In the 1800s, it was used to stop the labor movement during the Pullman strike. It was used against the people during 1968 and the 1992 riots. It was used against the people after Hurricane Hugo and Katrina. And the only time that it was used for good was to suppress the Klan in the 1800s and to ensure desegregation would stick in the 50s and 60s. So, in our torrid history, this act has only been used to protect American values two, maybe three times. So the biggest question on everybody's mind is, can Trump do this? Can he deploy the military against his own citizens under the false pretense of civil unrest? Unfortunately, yes, he can. Like Lyndon B. Johnson did in 1968 and Daddy Bush in 1992, he has the authority to release troops on us if he chooses and thinks the nation is in trouble. And to him, it is. I mean, think about it. 
the previous night, he was hidden in an underground bunker beneath the White House because some protesters were chanting. And that's very scary because what if he starts chanting because they're so infectious? They're, I mean, some of those chants are very, very clever and, they're, and they have a real good tune to them. And then the cops think, because he's chanting with the protesters, the cops think that he's like, a, like one of the Antifas. And then the cops start shooting him. That's, that's very scary. Now, Trump has the legal authorization to invoke the Insurrection Act of 1807, which counteracts the Posse Comitatus Act of 1878, which prevents troops being deployed on the American people without congressional authorization. But it wouldn't even matter because, let's be honest, most of Congress would be on his side. You have Republicans like Ted Cruz with their no-no protest bill, and Nancy Pelosi and the Democrats just reauthorized the Patriot Act, which was one of the most invasive and destructive bills to American civil liberties. Now, according to Ice Cream Yas Queen, Nancy Pelosi, the reauthorization is about strengthening our civil liberties. She says, and quote, central to that defense is, is how we protect and defend. Uh, yeah. uh, it's about our values, which uh, are part of our strength. It's about the health, education, and, and well-being of, of, of the people, uh, our children, our future, which is part of our strength. Our military might is part of our strength. Our, our intelligence is very much part of our strength. In order to provide force protection for our men and women in uniform when they go out there to protect and defend our country, force protection. She wants to force protection on us. You do not have our consent, Pelosi. Okay, we want consensual protection. You can't just fucking jam a condom in or on our genitals. Okay, the military isn't part of our strength. The workers are. We don't want more militarism. We want UBI, health care for all, and for you to stop posing for photo ops and do your fucking job. Now, not only has this created a stir for the civilians in this nation, but also for the troops. Because a lot of National Guardsmen and military soldiers have reached out to the GI Rights Network, who are actively working on putting together con conscientious objector packets. A guardsman that is having doubts about deployment and joined the National Guard because of his financial situation said, and quote, most of all, I feel that I cannot be complicit in any way when I see so many examples of soldiers and police acting in bad faith. Much like the police, the guardsman training doesn't involve de-escalation in these scenarios, and they have been said to use less than lethal weapons like rubber bullets, and tear gas. The problem here is that the guard, nor the cops, are properly trained to use these weapons. They still fire them like lethal weapons, which means that they are still going to cause irreparable damage. Kind of like how a pencil during a tornado can become a missile, a cop or an army ranger with a rubber bullet can still kill somebody. And this will only escalate things further. And tear gas is far worse than a rubber bullet. I mean, it is illegal chemical warfare that hasn't been used in a war since World War I. The Geneva Convention considers it a form of torture and too dangerous because it hits unintended targets and when it's fired into enclosed spaces, it becomes combustible. Individual governments said it was their only way to disperse protesters without force. Or another way is to listen to what the fuck we're saying. We've been talking about police brutality peacefully for decades and decades, and that itself is met with tear gas and rubber bullets. I mean, what are people supposed to do when, when, when you shoot gas and shoot them with fucking rubber bullets when we keep using peaceful tactics to talk to you about this shit? Now, some guardsmen and soldiers are excited to, quote, earn their stripes, but former Army Reserve Captain DeBarro says they're not thinking soberly about the moral injury of their actions. And at the end of the day, the PTSD and other mental strife won't be addressed or taken care of by this government. 
It'll be we the people, the sons and daughters of those that were fired upon that will help these former soldiers pick up the pieces and get their life and morality back in order. And if, and I know there's probably some people saying, well, you know, they probably won't fire at their own citizens. And you clearly have not been paying attention and have missed the various points in history when that's exactly what happened. Kent State, Blair Mountain, Black Wall Street, Seattle 1919, San Francisco 1934. The list keeps going on and on, and we're about to add America 2020 to it. This is an escalation from the parts of those at the top that are securing their positions of power with authoritarian force and calling it protection and civil rights. But there is a piece of legislation that is being taken into account that sheds some hope in this situation. Representative Justin Amash, who is a libertarian, proposed the Ending Qualified Immunity Act. This would ensure that cops are not protected after they murder somebody in cold blood, as we've seen time and time again. So it wasn't a Democrat that proposed this idea, but a third party libertarian. Remember, the Democrats expanded the Republican president's spying powers. The libertarian wants to reduce injustices. If you're confused about why we need more parties in our electoral process, just loop this part over and over again till you get it. Now, there are those that see this legislation as a hindrance to policing. Lieutenant Bob Kroll, the president of the police union in Minneapolis, has said that he's killed some people that hasn't really been bothered by any of it. Quote, I've been involved in shootings and not one has bothered me. Maybe I'm different. And yes, he is different. He is a psychopath that belongs behind bars in an underground bunker far, far away from society. I mean, he goes on to complain about the fact that the city spends too much money settling police violence and murder claims and can't afford to give cops raises. I don't know, maybe if they stopped beating the shit out of people and killing people, this wouldn't be an issue, right? He says the notion that cops are supposed to de-escalate is bullshit because they're supposed to go in guns a-blazing in all situations. Okay, cops are supposed to protect and serve communities, not live in a Michael Bay jerk-off fantasy. You don't get a raise for murder. And well, in America, if you're blue collar, you don't get a raise, period. We have arrived at a pivotal moment in our history, a moment that where a lot of people are seeing the system for what it is, an uncaring, callous, greed-driven void where human lives are less important than authoritarian fantasies, consumerism, and points on the stock market. We the people have said no more time and time again, and now we're screaming it. And it's becoming impossible for those on high to ignore us. As a Pennsylvania guardsman said, in this moment, the people who stay in need to very much think about what side of history they wanna be on. They really need to sit down and think about what they're willing to do for an oath that means trampling on their neighbors. This oath not only goes for soldiers, but us as citizens. What side of history are we choosing to be on? The side that champions a better future for all of us? Or the side that sacrifices us for establishment complacencies? Uh, I'm very excited because uh, the Citizen Revolution comedy shows are happening every single Friday in June, and then we will be doing them uh, intermittently throughout the summer. Uh, we're gonna be doing them in July, August, uh, possibly as well into September. Uh, because I don't, I don't foresee touring being an option going into those months. Um, so the Citizen Revolution comedy shows right now, June 5th, June 12th, June 19th, June 26th, July 10th, um, July 17th. Those are all the dates. Uh, um, July tickets will be out soon. June tickets are available right now. And here's the cool thing. The June 5th show. Two cool things with the June 5th show. 
you can purchase a ticket for all of the June shows at a discounted price right now. You can do that. Um, and, uh, and basically, I'll email you the little code after the show, and you can go in and just get tickets for all the other three shows and not even worry about this. Uh, and every time I do these pre-show messages, you can be like, eh, does, you're, we're good, Krish. We fucking nailed it already. We fucking nailed it already. Um, the second thing with the June 5th show is 100% of the ticket sales from June 5th are going to the Black Visions Collective. I'm donating all of that to the Black Visions Collective in Minneapolis, Minnesota to help with uh, community organizing and to help uh, with uh, protesters that are wrongfully arrested and put into prison. So, so to help them with bail funds uh, for that sort of stuff. Going forward, all of those other dates that I mentioned, I'm gonna be donating 50%, that's one half of the ticket sales, to a particular uh, grassroots movement, grassroots organization, activist group, um, small business venue, some that you might have heard about um, on this podcast itself, um, to journalists that uh, need it, independent journalists that need it. And uh, over the next few weeks, I'm gonna be contacting some of these places, making sure that they're cool with it, making sure that we can help each other out. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so not only will you get uh, independent, socially conscious comedy that you won't see anywhere else. And each single, each, each week is going to be a different show, you guys. It's going to be a different theme and a different show. Some of the segments that you might have seen in the past uh, episodes will come back um, and, and have a reprisal. Um, some, and maybe we won't, right? Um, and, uh, and then once, and they'll be recorded as well. Um, and, they'll, and then they'll become Forkful of Noodles episodes. So not only do you get that, you get this socially conscious comedy, but you'll also be helping um, grassroots organization, community building. Uh, this is my way of trying to give back, uh, doing the thing that I know how to do. Um, I know how to be a person that delivers information in a way that I think is interesting and fun. Um, and I am uh, I'm trying to use my voice to help certain organizations. And I know that I'm, I'm kind of a small fry uh, in this world of uh, sociopolitical comedy and commentary, uh, but I wanna, I wanna be able to do what I can to, uh, to, to help out. Um, I know Lee Camp does this as well. Uh, a lot of, lot of comedians do this. Ron Placone does this as well. And you know, I am um, uh, taking, taking the, the inspiration from uh, my peers and my colleagues and doing what I can to give back. Uh, to this world. Uh, so uh, yeah, so get your tickets, go to my website, krishmohan.com, uh, K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N. Grab them now, grab them early uh, because the spots are limited and the ticket sales end one hour before showtime. And then, I'm, and then I'll email you uh, the login information to enter the virtual theater. And then uh, we get in there and everybody will, will have a, a, a good time. I don't really have to worry about people being dicks in there. Most of the time, everybody's pretty cool. Uh, so uh, yeah, and, and these partnering uh, organizations and venues and such, I might, I might have them in the showroom with me and try to uh, give them a little, little platform to, uh, uh, you know, um, talk about what they do and, and who they are so we all get to understand where they're coming from. Uh, other ways you can help, as always, is uh, by becoming a sustaining member. Sustaining members get free tickets to these shows, they get free copies of my album, they get um, some unreleased stand-up comedy and storytelling content, they get early access to things. Um, so if you have the ability to, it'd be cool. It'd be awesome if you could become a sustaining member, you guys. Go to my website again, krishmohan.com. There's a donate tab uh, or to become a patron, or you can donate directly to the website itself. Uh, and you can make one-time donations if that's your thing as well. Uh, and you can download my album. My album right now available on Bandcamp for a dollar, but it's also available on all of the streaming and downloading platforms like Pandora and iTunes and Google Play and all of that sort of stuff. I haven't really made a big deal out of it because of the current state of affairs. Uh, eventually, we'll, we'll get to making a big deal out of it. Um, uh, I, I, I don't think that's particularly the prerogative right now. Uh, the album is available. It is out there. 
if you want to, uh, you can download it, you can stream it, you can share it. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and these are all the things that right now, because of the current state of affairs of the world with there being a pandemic and um, fucking police brutality problems rising up again, uh, these, these are basically how I'm making a living. These um, Citizen Revolution comedy shows, uh, the uh, sustaining memberships, um, and the album sales. So, uh, yeah, any one of those things will, will help me keep going, uh, paying some bills, and putting food on the table, and taking care of, like, hosting fees and, and all of the other um, responsibilities that come with uh with podcasting and, and content creation.